Hi, I'm Eric Ostro, host of Live at the Lord Town. For season three, we are focusing on the intersection of arts and advocacy. So many off-Broadway artists give back to their communities. This season, we are giving them the opportunity to speak about how and why they chose the causes they devote themselves to and how those causes help make them the people and artists they are today. Hi, good evening, everybody. My name is Eric Ostro. Welcome to Live at the Lortel. I'm so happy to be here tonight. Uh, I want to bring on my co-host for the evening, my dear friend, Joy D. Michelle. Joy, good evening, my dearest. Hello, lovely. How, How are, are you? you? How I'm are you? Very good. Thank you. I'm good. Okay. All right. Well, let's get right. <laughs> Me too. Let's get right to her. So uh, Tina Andrews is an international award-winning writer, director, and producer. She won the Writers Guild of America Award and two NAACP Image Awards for her CBS miniseries, Sally Hemings, An American Scandal. Current projects include From Selma to Sorrow and a new HBO Max period drama, Buckingham, based on her play and internationally acclaimed novel, Charlotte Sophia. Tina is very active with the American Cancer Society and is very passionate about reducing greenhouse gas emissions. Ladies and gentlemen, we're so honored to have her. Let's welcome Tina Andrews. Hi, everyone. Hi, good Hi. evening. Hi. We're Hi, so honored Eric. to have Thank you. you. Thank you. I'm so happy to be here. Thank you for inviting me. Of course. you. Um, of course we would have a great artist like you on, you know, um, this season we, we talk a lot about, um, where these are, where the artists meet their activism. So I'd love to start out about, um, what you stand behind in terms of your advocacy. I'd love to talk a little bit about, uh, the American cancer, uh, society and um, the work you do for them and, and why you chose to put your name and your time behind this incredible organization. Well, I have, um, it's, 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 it's really sort of sad, uh, Eric, every, and I shouldn't say every member of my family, but we, we are unfortunately in my, in my family on both sides predisposed to cancer. My mother passed away from it. My father passed away from it. Uh, all of my uncles, my both of my grandmothers. And unfortunately, in 2009, in the middle of me presenting my the, the first iteration of Buckingham, the play, I had a strange feeling in my lower back. Mm -hmm. And uh, when I finally got it checked out, I too ended up with a cancer scare. And, um, you know, it's, it's how you feel when you first hear that. Fortunately, it was, uh, the, it was the size of a marble. It was in my spine and they were able to, to get it out. But there was that moment when you are told all the things that could happen to you if the surgery had not gone as well as it did. Um, you know, suddenly my vanity came into play by I, clearly my health. You know, they told me that I might not be able to to ever walk again, that I would probably be a paraplegic. There are things that you that you no one really hears those things well. And um, and I really went to a dark place and thought, I don't know if I really want to be here anymore. Fortunately, I have a friend that I was that I called and was crying. Her name is Brenda, and I will thank her you know, until the, the last day of my life. Um, I said, I, you know, I, I don't know that I want to. If all of this is going to happen, my quality of life will be such that I don't, I don't know that I would want to stay here on the planet. And she said, if all of those things were to happen to you, you still know how to write. You would have your good mind you will get a wheelchair, you will will yourself up to your desk and you will continue to write. You cannot take yourself from all of us because that loss would be incalculable. So no, you've got to change the thinking and think positive. This guy has done eight of these surgeries this year 
and yours will also be successful. And um, it was that change in my thinking that I'm pretty sure helped me with a lot of this. And I, all of my friends came out to New York and were with me over that Thanksgiving holiday because I didn't know if I would see Christmas. You just don't know. Of course. Um, and I went into the hospital and six hours later, when he asked me, the doctor said he was going to ask me if I could wiggle my toes, because if I could, he would have gotten that tumor out cleanly and gotten all of it out. And I left my body and went to the Tate Mod. My spirit went to the Tate Modern in London, my one of my favorite, favorite places. Me too. Uh, and I had a... I, I can only describe it as an otherworldly experience with something. I don't know what it was. I don't know if it was God or an angel or the spirits of my parents or what it was, but it was unformed and so was I. And I had this discussion and the discussion was, have you done everything you want to do? And I remembered saying, "I maybe so. I would have liked to have painted more. Hmm. And and then I heard, well, you know, if you want to go back and paint, that would be a good thing. This is what I actually remember. If you want to go back and paint, that would be a good thing. And then I heard this faint voice saying, Tina, Tina. And it was the doctor. And when I, I was in recovery and when I came out of that, I immediately started to wiggle my toes on my own. And I said, are they wiggling? Are they wiggling? And he said, yes, <laughs> yes, they are. Wow. Literally six days later, I walked out of, well, not walked, because, you know, my brother came and got me, and so I was wheelchaired mm -hmm. out. But literally, I left the hospital six days later. Wow. And through rehabilitation, yeah, I mean, I was on crutches for a while. You got to remember, I started out as a ballet dancer. So I had mm -hmm. a pretty, I have a pretty straight, strong back, even with the, the situation. So I healed fairly quickly. But during that time, I remembered saying, Lord, if you, you've gotten me out of this and you've gotten me through this, I have got to talk to other people about how they are feeling a when you first hear it when you're going through it when you're going through chemo when you're going through radiation in my case i had a a, a um, radiation seed that that they sewed into between the the two um vertebrae and so i couldn't leave the i couldn't get on a plane you know because it was just going to set everything off but i wanted to do that for someone else in in a similar way that my friend had done for me by saying you can because everyone has dark thoughts whenever there's a health crisis you just and you don't know how to cope nobody teaches you hmm. these things and i'm a very spiritual person which is probably why my spirit went to the tape <laughs> don't ask me why the tape but the, it's my favorite place but i that's where i went and i would try to give back by um counseling certainly kids who are going through it because their energy is naturally up and, 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 and positive, but also anyone who ends up going through the experience because you, you feel so alone. And one of these days I'm going to uh, put that entire experience down in a, another one of my books because I came out of it. Okay. And for that, I thank God every day. And, you know, as does my, as does my, my brother, we'd, we'd love to be able to break that family that, you know, that familial uh, cycle. So that's one of many reasons why I want to give back. I know how people feel when they're going through it and are feeling hopeless. I'm sorry, that was so long winded, but that's no, actually, no, 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 that was exactly I haven't the... talked about it in years, but yeah. I'm glad that you shared that. Did you have to go through chemo and uh, radiation? No, the radiation well? seed took care of it. It was, okay. you know, it's like you're the, uh, where it was, it, he said, it's like a marble on vermicelli, the vermicelli being your nerves. And so I'm thinking, you know, when he said, if I nick one nerve, you'd be paralyzed. And I kept thinking, mm. you know, what is the likelihood <laughs> of him not nicking one nerve and there's so many so that's what the that's how i felt going into 
that situation. And I also, you know, listen, it, it was, I, I almost created another um, Paul Simon song, you know, as I, I'm making notes, how many different ways can you kill yourself? Well, you know, you can just cut your throat <laughs> or you can slit your wrist. Or you, so it was like 50 ways to take yourself out. And so mm -hmm. I ended up turning it into when I came across that list after it was over, I said, this is that dark place that a lot of people are in who don't have anyone to talk to mm -hmm. or to share. So I that's part of what I do now. Do you feel well, as though that experience has um, stayed with you in such a way that you live your life regularly, daily, as if it is something precious and it is something to really, really take advantage of? Absolutely. Let me tell you how I changed my diet. <laughs> I am the green fruit juice queen. I have done things with spinach and kale that you would not <laughs> believe. So I, yeah, I do vegetable juicing. I change that, which is so good, you know, for complexion and for everything else. But um, I, I made a, a, a concerted effort to change and to change my thinking also. And I meditate quite a bit more because how you think about yourself you know, you put it back out to the world. And so I wanted to never, ever feel that I would find myself in that dark place again. And so that's why I would like to do a, um, I would like to write a book about the experience because it was quite profound for me and in, in many ways became a, a teachable moment. And I try to share it with, um, with others when I can, not, and try not to do it in such a, a gruesome, negative, morbid way, but just exactly as it happened to me, who generally has an upbeat, lively personality. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. So if people want to donate their time or or make a donation, obviously we keep putting the the link up on uh, on the screen, but I believe it is cancer.org yes. uh, to go to the American Cancer Society and you can yes. make a donation. Yes. And I, I, I do know that they have programs as well as um, with um, service animals and people going in and reading to people. And so... There's a lot of, I think the American Cancer Society does a lot of incredible uh, programs for volunteers to, to, to reach out and, and to help people that are, that are suffering and that were in your position, uh, that they go to that dark place. Yes. I read from my book, in fact, my, uh, the book that I wrote on Charlotte Sophia, you know, I read uh, yeah. because there was a, a woman who just couldn't believe that there was a Queen of England who was a who was a woman of color and i said oh yes i've got 21 years of research and it's oh you know when you come back that i would like to know a little more about her and i said i can do better than that i'll i'll read a little bit from uh, you know the next time i come so i have done that as well um my father when he was going through that um there was a marvelous nurse that was his day his day to day nurse and we got to know her she became almost a member of the uh you know of the family so i know how that resonates with people i would just like to say that uh, you know right now there are so many stories that are being told about um the black experience um usually dealing with race. I would love to see that as a screenplay where it's a human experience and it's a black woman who's dealing with her health and how she overcomes. And that's what you have done. You have been an overcomer and an achiever and you are thriving. So just for Thank the record, you. that would be an awesome screenplay. Thank you. Thank you. Mm -hmm. I couldn't agree we, more. We tend to not go to the doctor as often uh, as we should. If we're not feeling sick, we have a tendency not to go. So those things like yearly checkups and and all of that, you know, it tends to be like that D.L. Hughley used to have a joke about taking black people, taking the, the, the dog to the vet. So no, you better get out there and drink some Robitussin and call it a day. <laughs> so it's, um, I mean, honestly, but it's, that's what tends to happen is that you mm -hmm. wait too late and then sometimes it is too late. So mm -hmm. yeah. When you spoke so about I changing your diet back from the dark place, uh, you know, yes, I'll have to go through it again in the writing of it, but I think that it could be very beneficial to someone else.
I agree. When you when you talk about changing your diet, um, did you have um, the traditional Southern kind of diet? Was it a hard transition for you or was it an easy transition? My dear, when you come back from what you think is going to be death, it, it was real easy, mm. <laughs> very easy. Um, I, because I came back to, you know, making sure that there was no, no food in the refrigerator anyway. I didn't, for A, I didn't know if I was going to come back from the hospital. And I knew that I would be at least six to eight days. And, you know, I just didn't want a bunch of stuff in there that would have got, that would have wilted and gone and gone bad. Um, I had my brother do two things when he drove me from the hospital back to my, uh, my house out on Long Island. We stopped at Michael's, the art supply store, because the entity, whatever it was that I was having that conversation with, it said, yeah, you should go back and paint. Yeah, I bought art supplies that day. And there are so many farmers markets. You know, when you live out on Long Island, you can just get all the fabulous fresh um, vegetables and fruit. And I mean, I loaded up. And... Uh, my brother went out because I said, oh, my God, this should not be I shouldn't be juicing it where I take the pulp out. So he went out and got me a bullet so that you can actually juice the complete, you know, you know, all of it. Mm -hmm. And uh, I started developing recipes. It was very easy to do, especially when I discovered that, boy, you know, if you do this enough, you probably will lose a good five pounds. So. <laughs> that was incentive, but it was very easy for me to change the diet. Now, I didn't, when you say traditional Southern, I wasn't doing a lot of fried foods, but um, I, I wasn't quite eating properly because I am a writer. I would grab whatever was around. That's Maybe cool. I'd cook on Sunday and have enough to, to eat for like four days. I always do big meals on, on Sundays. If my friends did not come down from the city to my place to hang out um that's how i would that's that's how i would cook for myself now when my friends are around then we all everybody contributes and everybody um cooks and it's it's a different thing but i mean i'd be eating spaghetti and pasta and pizza you know there was mm -hmm. it was and so when this happened it was almost it was like overnight i was able to do it and it has stuck with me. I would love to go back a little bit in your in your career and talk about uh, Sally Hemings. Yes. And the work um, and the series that was developed and uh, the amount of research that you did for so long. And now I hear, uh, if it's not out already, that you are revising because so much has happened between the 20 years that it was written and now that you're yes. in the midst of rewriting um, the book. Sally Hemings, the book, yes. yes. Correct. Oh, well, my um, goodness. But I would love for you to talk about the Sally Hemings experience and, and how that came to be. And I mean, that to me is, is very exciting. It's, well, listen, it's, it, it was, I would say 16, I, I really don't have, a fourth project in me, I will literally be dead if I have to go through the amount of research that I go through to write these historical projects that I am so attracted to. Um, my father was alive then, told me about his cousin who lived across the street from one of the Hemings descendants. Um, she, was, she was actually our cousin, his second cousin, so I guess my third cousin. And um, the woman ended up being one of the first people that I spoke to on this journey. And she told me um, a story that had been handed down to her. Now, if you know my career, then you know I was also in Roots. So I, I know these stories about, you know, grandparents handing down like, like the, the, the grills of, 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 of yore handing down stories from one generation to the next because it was illegal for us to know how to read and write during slavery. And she told me a story about Mr. Jefferson and Sally Hemings. And it was not a negative, you know, typically, 
you know, these stories are always stories of rape or, you know, no affection and abuse. And she told me a different story. So I asked her if there were any other family members that were around that, so that, you know, who had been told this, this, a story so that I could put the stories together. And so she turned me on to another cousin and then another cousin. And eventually it was very interesting, Eric, people then began to call me, hi, my name is so-and-so and so-and-so, and and I am a descendant of uh, Thomas Jefferson and Sally Hemings. And then they would name which child they were descended from. Some of these cousins did not know the other cousins and yet the oral history was the same. Hmm. So once I said, wait a minute, so you guys are in, you know, um, uh, Peoria, Illinois, and you guys are in Colorado and others are in Virginia and some in Philadelphia and the stories are all similar Mm -hmm. about the African who was the the progenitor of the Hemings family and then uh, giving birth to Betty Hemings and then Betty Hemings uh, through her slave master, which was a rape situation. He was, you know, that was what that was. This is Thomas Jefferson's wife's father, who was also the, uh, who was also um, Sally Hemings' father, um, ended up, Jefferson ended up inheriting 135 slaves that he got in the dowry from from the wife, the white wife. And they all came to Monticello, which was being built and was built by slaves. Mr. Jefferson enslaved over 100. He inherited 135 and he had another 70. There was always a couple of hundred slaves that Mr. Jefferson had enslaved on that property. But the story of he and Sally was always a, another kind of a story. So I go through all of this research and discover that he goes to France mourning the death of his wife and dating a lot of French women, but nothing serious because he is in mourning for the dead wife. And since for his youngest daughter, his oldest daughter is already there and Sally Hemings brother, James is already there. um, He asks for his youngest daughter to come over to France. She has to be accompanied by a slave woman. That slave woman was pregnant and Betty Hemings chose her daughter, Sally, to accompany Polly Jefferson. By now, Sally is 14 years old she gets to France and Jefferson opens the door and in through it comes not only his daughter, but the spitting image of his dead wife. So I said, oh my goodness, that's a, that's a story of, you know, that's a human story. That's a, that's, that's something that says to me, here's a guy in mourning for the dead wife and in through the door, comes a slightly tan, only slightly, because she was quadroon, so she was only one fourth black, so she was very, very light skinned. Mm-hmm. In comes your wife. And so I said, well, now this is a Barbie doll situation. All he's got to do is dress her up, which he did in the French clothes and teach her the language, and and he's got his wife back. So um, in putting all of those elements of that story together, it took another, I can't tell you how long to get it sold, because none of the networks or the studios um, wanted to do a story about the third president of the United States having any kind, no matter how you categorize it, they did not want to do a story about the third president of the United States who wrote, all men are created equal. First of all, they didn't want to even deal with the fact that he was, um, you know, an enslaver, but certainly they didn't want to hear a story about him being in any kind of a relationship with one of his slaves, let alone having seven, five, five to seven children. They didn't all live, but he had a lot of children with this woman. And when he wasn't at Monticello, she did not give birth. And as beautiful as she has been described, there would have been other situations on that plantation where she she would have either 
met someone or been with someone who was there, another, another uh, enslaved man on the property, there would have been some other relationship that would have brought forth children, as was the case with her mother, who had the, her white looking Hemings kids through rape. And she had black Hemings children through the man that she was, quote unquote, that she had jumped the broom with. So this said to me, okay, something's going on here that is unexplainable. But for me as a dramatist, it was just, it was just delicious. Couldn't get the movie, couldn't get the project made. One fine day I'm playing cards in my house out here and I'm shuffling. News comes on. Thomas Jefferson father's children with Sally Hemings, you know, news at 11. And we all, it was like EF Hutton. We all went, what? <laughs> <laughs> what? And so my one friend, my friend, Eric said, mm -hmm. girl, you may get, you may get that old project mm -hmm. off the ground. Now it had served as a writing sample. Couldn't get it made, but it was a writing sample for all of the other jobs right. that I got, including, you know, why the fool's falling off. So um, Monday morning, my phone was ringing off the hook. I had an mm -hmm. opportunity to sell this almost anywhere in town and CBS offered me four hours. And so I, I took that. But it was still 16 years from the start of all of that research and all of those interviews with Hemings descendants and, and, and trips after trips after trips to Monticello um, to outline and put that, that together. And so thank God once it did hit, you know, once it, it got on the air, yes, it was extremely controversial because they're going to be those who will say, oh no, she was 14 and he was 40. So mm -hmm. you know, it was a rape. And then I said, but wait, 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 let's just understand that a 14 year old 200 years ago, you were, you had to get married. Most women were married before they were 16 years old. Jefferson's daughter married at 16. So the pedophilia part of this, I had already taken out of the equation because I know that from writing so much history. Right. Uh, and they said, well, no, how could she have any affection for him? She's enslaved. She would have to do what he told her to do. So there was that back and forth. But guys, I cannot tell you how many people wrote me letters and said, um, I had a particular opinion about this story but the way you presented it, it made sense to me. And as a result, Monticello sort of, uh, you know, changed their position. At one point they had said, if you even shoot in our airspace, we will sue you. Mm -hmm. They were not, they did not want the story out there uh, at that point. Public opinion changed. Those guys changed. The Hemings decided they wanted to be buried at Monticello if they wanted to be because they were legitimate descendants of Thomas Jefferson. So much has changed in the 20 years since that um, original production. And I would like to I would like to think that I had a little bit, just a little bit to do with uh, with that change. So is that the changes that you're going to make? I mean, I have a quote here, if you don't mind me saying Um uh, people have come to grips with the facts. Was it rape? Did Jefferson really care for Sally? Or was he just with her because she looked exactly like his dead wife? Whatever the relationship was, it was. It happened. And, and that's the reality. And that's the reality. So when you go back maybe to this now to kind of give it an update, um, what's to be added to it? Well, first of all, the acceptance from most white people who did not think it even took place, period. Right, there's there's um, there's acceptance that there that there was a relationship and it yielded. They'll people will constantly say, oh, yeah, but it was the one child. All right. You guys can say that if you want. But it was five living children. Two of them were so white that they ran off and he gave them money to go. Carriages and fifty dollars was a lot of money in seventeen, um, you know, in seventeen. Uh, uh, when was it? Uh, 18, eight, 18, uh, 20 or eighteen? Yeah, eighteen twenty when they left. Um, he let them go, and so we've lost them to history. But the ones who stayed on the black side of the color line, 
continue to tell their story. He freed them. He could not afford to free anyone, but he freed five Hemings children. So, you know, you say to yourself, if you are a raping slave master and you're dying and you're broke, you need to sell all of them to pay your bills. You're not, you know, you're not attached emotionally. Um, people who were enslaved were like another candlestick or a chair or a table mm -hmm. to the enslaver. So you look at the at what happened and you put, you know, connect those dots and you say, okay, well, there is a story here that there was something between them and, and there was. Well, at Monticello, there is now an entire exhibit. It's the Sally Hemings mm -hmm. exhibit where you yes, can actually go and interact. Yeah, so mm -hmm. things have changed on the mountain. Yeah. And a lot of books have been written since. Mm -hmm. And that's what I'm adding to my piece. I'm going back and I'm interviewing quite a few of the, the descendants. We've all become a huge family. I am not a, a, a Blood Hemings member, but I am surrogate. Of and, course you are. Uh, <laughs> and they have given me quotes that will be uh, in, in in the book. Well, I can't wait to read that. Go ahead, yeah. Joy. I know you got, go ahead. Yeah, I, I want to go back a bit because you've had this um, amazing career, starting as an actress, um, a groundbreaking actress in daytime television, um, and then moving <laughs> on to, uh, and, and I mean that for those that um, don't know, it was the first interracial relationship on daytime, daytime television, correct? Yes, it yeah. was. I was the first. I had the first interracial kiss on daytime TV. Nichelle Nichols had the first interracial kiss in prime time on Star mm -hmm. Trek. But yeah, we sort of pioneered in, in yeah. Larry and Larry and Sharon. Yeah. <laughs> Who? Larry and Sharon were that the um, on Days of Our Lives? No, Valerie. No, David and Valerie. David, David and Valerie. Valerie. Yeah. I was the original. Valerie Grant, the original so, Valerie Grant. And if you think I don't get it on Twitter, oh my goodness, can't you come? Can you come back? It would be so great for you to do Valerie again. And I'd say, honey, I'm not coming back and play somebody's grandmother. <laughs> That's not who I am. So moving from that um, yeah. to being a part of Roots and having um, Alex Haley as a writing mentor and then moving into writing, can you talk about? Um, that transition, because there's a lot of artists who want to move from being a performer and they want to put power behind the pen or now the keyboard. Um, how did you make that transition? And also, how did you get your first um, film actually produced? Because the first one that I knew about was How to Fools Fall in Love. That's, that was my introduction to your writing. Um, so if there was something before that, how that did you get the produced. first one funded? Okay. All right. Um, so Why Do Fools Fall in Love was my first produced film. But what people don't realize is that there were 15 scripts <laughs> prior to that. Uh, the studios make, in those days, things are different now because we got so many conglomerates that own, that, that own the studios now. Um, the studios would commission maybe 40 or 50 scripts per year. And they maybe would only make 16 or 17 films. So when you do become a writer, you automatically go into this gig knowing that, you, well, your project might not get made. It just might not get made. So you know that going in. I was very lucky in that I, I worked and was following Alex Haley around like a, like a dead cat. I mean, he was sensational to, to, to hear his oratory. He would explain how he discovered his own family members and what he went through. He also fell into a dark situation where on the boat going over to Africa, trying to connect that the dots of getting his family, uh, getting that family history back to Africa. He almost jumped into the sea. He mm -hmm. felt as if his ancestors were calling him saying, this is, um, this is gonna be a bust. Mm -hmm. um, just come and join us. And then he said it was as if one of his grandmothers reached over and pulled him back from the edge and allowed him to stay on that ship so that he could get to Africa and wow. in fact met his African ancestors. I was, I would watch Alec give these lectures 
on roofs. I was at every one of them. And and he finally said, so you here again? And I said, I, I'm just fascinated. <laughs> and I, as I watched him, I, I kept saying to myself, I want to do that. I want to be able to stand in front of people and just just enthrall them with a story. Flash forward, I'm writing scripts. I had written Sally Hemings as a film. I had also written Frankie Lyman as a as a straight movie, not as the comedy it ended up uh, uh, mm -hmm. being. But I'd written it as a, as a straight film about a, 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 a young man who just descends into the abyss of drug abuse. And I was sending um, my scripts around to people, praying for somebody to produce. And you know, you don't hear. So on the, on the cover would be my name, my whatever address would be my office <laughs> and, and a phone number. And I was in between gigs and I called my answering service to see if anyone had called and there on the tape, it said, hi, I hope that this, I've gotten the right Tina Andrews, but it, it, are you the same Tina Andrews who was in Roots? Uh, if you are, this is Alex Haley. And I would like to talk to you about one of your scripts that someone sent to me. And I'm thinking, what? Well, I'm praying that they're not going to cut my phone off before I can make that return. <laughs> <laughs> I'm telling you, I'm broke. Now, you know, so I was broke. And, and so I, I ended up calling the number and he said, when did you become such a good writer? And I said, oh my God, Alex, it's been a long time. And he said, I would like um, to send a ticket said, are you available for the next two, maybe three weeks to come down to my ranch in Tennessee? Uh, I'm doing this project for PBS called Great Men of African Descent. And I love how you write historical characters. Um, maybe we can work on it together. Now, imagine my face. I'm on the phone. This is Pulitzer Prize. This is Alex Haley saying, you want to work with broke me? <laughs> And you want to send me a ticket and bring me down for two or three weeks. I quit that little job that I had. I went into the office and I'll I said, well, today will be my last. <laughs> oh. And Alex um, sent the ticket. And I got on a plane and my life changed at that at that point. I bet. He gave me one of the guest houses on his property called the Duck House. And um, and we sat there and worked on this material together. The first uh, installment was going to be on Alexander du the three Alexander Dumas, the mm -hmm. grandfather who was in Napoleon's army, whose son was the Alexander Dumas who wrote The Count of Monte Cristo and The Three Musketeers and all that, who, whose son was the writer who wrote Camille. And we were going to be doing that for PBS. And he just took me under his wing. Oh, there are people you have to meet, Oprah, Maya Angelou. He just became this, it was absolutely an amazing experience. Before he died, he set me up at Columbia Studios. And that is how I got my very first film, mm. uh, not made, but got, my, you know, got a chance to write a movie on assignment for mm -hmm. Columbia. Mm. Alex, of course, died and I mourned his death for the longest time because at that point I'd lost my father. So now my father's dead and my father figure is now gone. And it mm -hmm. was rough for me, but he opened up the doors to Hollywood for me as a screenwriter. Um, I have a question from the audience, a um, question from Karen Jordan. You have such a highly esteemed career. How has your career as a grad? How has, I can't, I can't hear you. You froze. Yeah, Eric, you froze. Here I am. Question okay. from Karen Jordan. You have such Hi, a highly... Karen. Yes, hi, Karen. You have such a highly esteemed career. 
How has your career as a groundbreaking actress on soap operas, TV series, and in film informed your brilliant writing career? Well, you know, I think when you get mad enough, <laughs> if you get upset enough, you will write about that experience. I was on that soap opera in that groundbreaking role. And when those negative letters came in, calling me everything but a child of God, uh, because they didn't like the fact that it was an interracial relationship. And they certainly hated it when we kissed. We kissed on a Friday, five for the first time we kissed on a Friday. And uh, 5,000 letters showed up at NBC by Monday morning. I could not handle the vitriol and the animus and the, the just the, the horror that I was reading. And we would get our mail from our little pigeonholes before we actually started taping. And I would be uh, too upset to tape. So the producer said, we cannot give Tina her mail until after she, <laughs> after she finishes taping and then she can go home and cry. <laughs> We're not gonna we're not gonna give her the mail before she shoots. Um, when I was on the soap, my dad was alive, and my my father is was the most wonderful person in the world for me. I'm the quintessential daddy's girl. Dad said, "Why are you going through this when you know how to write? Write those empowered roles, those dignified roles for black women, and maybe you'll write something that you can put yourself in." as an actress, um, and then you, you won't care what anybody says or what anybody writes. Okay, that was great, but when the network could no longer handle the relationship, they did not fire the white guy. Mm -hmm. I was the one taken off the show, That's right. which meant then that the, the entire black family that was on the show didn't have the main character there. So slowly but surely, all of them went away. So that was hurtful for me. And I held on to that anger for a long time. And I said, I'm gonna be that black female writer who is going to write these stories. I said, I'll do the ultimate interracial story. And that was one of the initial <laughs> impetuses for me to write Jefferson is selling <laughs> So I said, ah, you think you don't like Valerie and David? Why don't I tell you about the president <laughs> and his black woman? <laughs> <Yeah. Take that. laughs> so sometimes uh, some of the work that I do comes out of anger for what I do not see in mm -hmm. film mm -hmm. and television. It is getting mm -hmm. better. Let me let's say that. But certainly when I was first starting, uh, there were very few black women writers. Uh, there were very few black writers that were getting uh, positioned at all. And I have, have had this marvelous platform uh, on which to do my to do my work. Again, it is a lot easier, but I realize that uh, most of us don't know our history. And that is why I am so um, interested in telling our stories to um, a larger audience. Tina, Hope that answers you your question, Karen. <laughs> Tina, do you think um, things are changing? Do you feel like, um, you know, many people feel like uh, theater, film, TV needs to be broken down completely and then built back up. Do you see hope? Do you see change? Are you optimistic about it? I want to add to. I want to add to his question. And what is your what is your hope for the future? Of television. Well, I, I will I will say this: it is changing. I've been around long enough to see it go from from you know none of us, and then roots all of a sudden, and 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 then it slowly started to trickle. And we have you know we had the, a second wave of black exploitation films, and then uh, it, it became black films, and so now we're back to um, being considered. Our our work is being considered. Um, quite critically and seriously uh, by male and female. Uh, theater, I do believe, is in the process of being broken down and building back up. Theater was the last holdout where they're just simply, they're too few of the us's of the world behind the scenes make, who get a chance to make choices as to what we're going to see on Broadway. 
uh, and, and, in, on, and off Broadway. And so I think that there is a new, probably a new model that's going to come in there. It's, it's a, you know, it's slow because there's only what, 47 or so theaters and so many off-Broadway theaters. Um, and so, you know, people can pick and choose. Um, the subject matter, the black subject matters um, that will be chosen for theatrical experiences, that will change. So I do have a lot of hope there. As far as film and television is concerned, I think that we're going at a fairly steady pace. I mean, I, there are very few shows now where the entire cast, you know, where there are all white casts. Um, there are people of color, there are you know, members of the LGBTQ uh, community there. Uh, it, that is changing. So again, I'm a glasses half filled kind of gal. I see it moving forward and I think it's gonna stay. I mean, I think that this is the base where we are now is the base. And so it can only get better from here. Hmm. Speaking of getting better, um, I would love to talk about uh, Queen Charlotte. Yes. And uh, what's happening with that. Um, uh, one of the acclaimed novels was Queen Charlotte Charlotte, uh, Sophia Myth Madness, and the more. Um, viewers got a taste of Queen Charlotte watching uh, Bridgerton, but your book came out in 2013. And since um, the royal family has had so many changes and so much happening, um, your book keeps um, selling. Like it's oh going up and yeah. Incredible. Eric, the book, you know what? It, 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 it actually, it, it, it's amazing. It took me, that's been the longest book. It took me the longest amount of time to write that book. Uh, it was eight years. And a lot of it had to do with the fact that there was very little information that was readily available when I first started. It, it was supposed to have been a follow-up, frankly, to Sally Hemings. Um, and so I would fly over to London all the time. In fact, I mean, that's where I, that's, that's a, London has become a second home for me. And it is where, when I am ready, that is where I'm going to retire. I love and it over where, there. And where the it. Tate is, right. <laughs> and it's where the, it's my favorite place um, too. Yeah. Oh, good. I'm, oh, I'm so glad. That's good to hear. The best. Um, I went over there and I would be researching at the British Museum and at the British Library, and then they kind of got to know me. So this one guy, Sir Nigel, um, would send me via email. I would I'd have a rendering of Charlotte's shoes. You know, she, she had a quite small foot, size five, and I, you know, they started to send things to me. So any excuse to go over there, I just use. I'd hop on a plane and I'd go, and I have a particular hotel that I absolutely adore that is a big you know in a victorian conversion so mm. i'm really at home over there um i get my pulled pork from the jamaican section in notting hill <laughs> you know I, I have a, i'm really at home over there so i started on the book and when i had a beginning a middle and an end it, i outlined loosely i do bullet points so i said get to get to this part of the story by chapter, at least chapter five, that kind of thing. It took eight years. The moment wow. I finished the book, my girlfriend called me and said, Tina, we have a huge fundraiser um, th that's going on out here in LA, in Santa Monica. Do you have a play? Uh, I need something. I want, I want it to be a black female playwright and I'm calling you first. Just like when you're an actress and somebody says, hey, do you play tennis? Do you ride a horse? You're supposed to go, yes. yes. <laughs> <laughs> because I can act and like so, I can. Yeah. yeah, that's right. That's okay. And your well, resume like says you can, yeah. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> so um, I told her, I said, when is the event? And she said, in August, and this was February. Uh, and I said, I do. I just finished my book. It's roughed out. The, the rough version is at the time 600 and something pages. Uh, the rough was done. And I said, I can probably cut into that story, do the first third as a play. And I'll do that. So can you believe that I wrote that play from in February and put it up in August? Mm. The, the response 
response floored me. I was quite shocked because most people did not realize there was a queen of England who was black and I didn't have her take that white makeup off. Frankly, we never saw her without the makeup until the very end of the show where she started wiping it off once he discovered wow. that she was actually a black woman, which happened on their wedding night when all that white paint had to come off. And he's like, girl, no, you are not. <laughs> King George has, because it, you know it, it was an arranged marriage so they didn't meet mm -hmm. she's german and he was british and they didn't meet until their wedding the mm -hmm. day of the wedding so she's all you know she's all in the white paint she's got the veil on so you know they get married and so now it's and they go to the it's the whole big reception and la 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 now it's wedding night <laughs> and that's when he discovers. He gives her some pearl earrings, and as he puts them around her neck, it's like, what is all this? <laughs> What's going on? And he gets the, the kerchief and dips it into the water, the water pitcher, and starts wiping. And then her slightly brown skin is visible. And he says to the ladies in waiting, bathe her get that wig off. I want to see exactly what I had to marry in order to keep, you know, to save England mm -hmm. from being in war with France. Mm -hmm. So once he discovered that she was in fact a woman of color, she was beautiful to him. Mm -hmm. So they made a deal. We don't have to tell the court. We don't have to tell anybody about it. You can continue this mm -hmm. subterfuge of, of white paint and, um, and hope for the best. He did not divorce her. He was so happy with her. He ended up blowing off his, you know, the other girlfriends that he had, the other women that he cared about. And they went on to have, wait for it, 15 children. <laughs> 15, wow. 15 children of which their third son gave birth. Uh, uh, his, his daughter was Victoria, who became Queen Victoria. And mm -hmm. all of the royals sitting on the throne right now are descended from this woman of color. So the play was just so shocking to people. And that's the way it has been for me in the presentation of this story uh, for, for all of these years. Yeah. So I can't talk about where we are at HBO because that's still, I'm still in development okay. with them. Okay. But I can tell you, oh my God, am I having the best time with I that bet you are. Oh, they That's are. It's, oh, it's it's absolutely wonderful. So hopefully mm -hmm. we get to do six to eight episodes and and maybe this time next year I'll come back on and let you know. Yes, yes, please. I mean, it's amazing to me about what's happening right now in the um with Meghan Markle and um you know uh that she is half black and the descendants were all the way from Victoria's mother all the way down. And uh, Victoria's grandmother. Victoria's grandmother, excuse Charlotte me. Was Victoria's grandmother, yeah, yeah. Uh, all the way down. And uh, the uh, explosion that happened over there when he married her, um, how some people felt about it and, um, some good, some bad, um, some really bad, um, and if they're what what their children will be. Uh, I don't know if you saw that interview, but I mean, it's it's just incredible. I, I I'm so excited for you and and to see um, what Charlotte will turn out to be. I have a sequel that I am uh, the the sequel will be the book. I have there are two books that I have that will be coming there's a sequel that will be out in 24. Uh, please do not ask me how i juggle all of these projects i have absolutely no idea how i i do this but i'm a workaholic so i guess mm -hmm. i do it you know because i'm alive having gone through that other horrible ex experience i am living each day to the fullest mm -hmm. and trying to be at the top of my creativity so they there will be actually it's not a sequel but a prequel Hmm. So I will talk about the black woman uh, who was married to one of the Knights Templars who ends up begetting 
uh, is in the genealogy that brings us to Charlotte so that we'll know how her family, you know, uh, inherited their ethnicity. Wow. It's a prequel, right? You know, yes. I, this is such important information, you know, just for everybody to have, but also in art schools. Eric and I went to graduate school together. And oh. I remember when we did our, we did something that's called a salon, where we do different our salon. Yeah. periods. And you have to research all these different um, royals. And then you do, at, once all the research is done, you do this improvisation. And it was so frustrating because at that time, there were very, very few Black people that were at our university. In my class, I was the only Black female. In the class before mine, there were like maybe five Black people. The class after mine, maybe five. It was like very, very few. So when it was time to do the salon, and we had to research people, we had this list like the Russian czar and you know all this. And, and I remember, um, I think Christy Montreux Larson played Queen Victoria, I believe, in our class. And had that information been known that Queen Victoria was a descendant, was a black woman, that would have been a whole different conversation about who is playing this role. And also That's for, right. my, and also That's for right. myself That's as right. an artist, because I felt so isolated. I felt like, oh my, so I had to go and do research to try and find somebody black to justify my being at this event that we were improving. This is this information is needed to know that it's Victoria, there's Charlotte. Universities need to know art universities so that the the young people that are there have representation. Because as it is now, a lot of people don't feel um real representation. And, and you real... feel that it's all slavery, you know, especially you know, when we live here in America. Um, I have not really done a, a historical piece since Jefferson because, you know, in going back through our history, we can only go back so far anyway, in terms of America, um, it's all going to be slavery. Uh, to know that we were, we are you know, descend from, from royalty and not just royalty, but also, you know, with royal connections. You were talking about Queen Victoria, who is and was rather herself a woman of color because her grandmother was a woman of color. Queen Victoria um, raised in Windsor Palace a young black woman who grew up with all of the clothes and the accoutrements and the, and, and the various languages. She was educated and refined. Uh, she grew up in that household. She was African. So we're not now talking about someone who could maybe pass for white or was very light skinned. We're talking about an African girl from age nine that Victoria became the godmother of. These are stories that we just they just seem to be expunged from the historical record. And if I don't do anything else with my life, I'm going to tell all those stories. And we want to hear them because they're not there. That's They're right. not there. They're not there in the history books. We got to yes. dig deep, which is why I'm very grateful that you're a workaholic and that you are working on, you have all of these balls in the air. You know, I don't know when you yes. sleep, but I'm very grateful that you, <laughs> that you're here to stay to, to tell these stories and to, to wake up, wake us up and say, listen, we were, we were not just this. We were this as well. Yeah. Well, I hope all of these shows That's are right. produced and and for those I'm and sorry? become required. I hope all of these shows are produced joy? and I said I hope all of these shows are produced and become required reading in all of these art programs. Require we all well, all the programs have required list. They should be required reading. Good. That's good. I that's why I generally start all of my material as either a book or as a play. We all know that by the time it gets to a film or television version, that there's, there's a lot of input. You know, you got studio executives and other producers and people who can weigh in. But when you are a playwright or when you are an author, those words on the page are actually what you intended. And that's why I tell people, if you wanna know who I am, please read my books. Mm. Because then you will discover who I, who I actually am, and what my intention is with a particular 
story. Yeah. Um, I do have um, it. I, I can talk to you, uh, Miss Andrews, for uh, hours and hours. <laughs> we are up at our hour, um, but I have learned so much in this past hour, um, and I cannot wait to see everything that you're going to be putting out. Um, uh, we're so honored that you are on our show and that you gave us your time and your knowledge and shared your artistry with us. Um, yes. And we will leave the American Cancer Society up. I also know that you are very passionate about reducing greenhouse gas emissions. Uh, that is something that you are also very passionate about. Um, thank you, Deborah, for your question. Um, that is our show for this evening. We are taking a couple of weeks off and returning on Monday, February 28th with Queen Jean. Queen Jean is a New York City-based costume designer who has draped over 50 shows and counting. She is a founder of the Black Trans Liberation and has fully committed her voice for the advocacy of marginalized communities with an emphasis on Black trans people. Information about our guests in March and beyond as well as how to attend one of our online reading recordings can be found on our website, live at the lordtell.com. Thank you for joining us. Let's all get vaccinated, get boosted, wear a mask and be safe. Theater is coming back, ladies and gentlemen. Yes. Yes. Um, and we hope to see you at the theater really soon. Um, watch for Miss Tina Andrews because there's lots coming out from her as well. Have a wonderful evening. Thank you, Miss Andrews. You Thank are you. a true artist. Thank and you. Uh, we are honored to have you here tonight. And thank you thank to my you. dear friend, Joy. Mm, Have a wonderful evening, everybody. Please stay safe, and we'll see you in a couple of weeks. Good night. Good night.